Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Corrado. I've been with Nikon for 35 years, and I've been taking pictures for over 40 years. We've got these really cool conversations with some really epic artists, and we actually have a nice up-and-coming young artist who just graduated college. Taylor Gray is with us right now. Taylor, how are you doing? Hey, Mike. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, Where are you, know, you now? You're on the West Coast? That's correct. Yep. I'm in Oregon right now. Um, uh, probably going to be moving back up to Washington, but uh, yeah, things are good here. Weather's nice and, uh, you know, spending a decent amount of time inside, but all is well here. Well, I got to brag on you a little bit here. You are an up-and-coming filmmaker uh, and uh, photographer. You started at a very young age. You're just graduating college. We'll talk a little bit about that. But if you're tuning in, we wanted to put together a collection of some of, of Taylor's early work here as he emerges through his career. And he's going to give us the backstory on, uh, you know, five to seven images as we move forward over the next hour. The Creator's Hour was created to inspire you and educate you during these crazy, challenging times during the pandemic. And so, you know, while we've been talking to a lot of ambassadors and legendary photographers, we want to talk to somebody like you, Taylor, to talk about what it's like to get started in this business, because I think a lot of people can learn from you. I've learned from you through our Instagram live talks about how you create photo reels or film reels uh, and create a nice sizzle reel of your work. Um, how are you doing during these times and how are you staying creative? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, I am more of an outdoor based photographer. Um, but you know, to keep myself busy, you know, it's shooting out the window, even, um, shooting right in my own backyard. There's little trails, uh, right outside. That I like to go, um, on trips and also diving deep into the archives of past work and really revisiting those, um, getting a second glance at images I might've overlooked previously. Uh, that's been really fun to do. And, and, and looking back and, and kind of reminiscing on this, those early images and early memories of photography has been just an absolute blast uh so uh hopefully looking to get outside and on some new trips maybe later in this summer when things maybe start winding down a bit but uh right now deep in the archives and it's it's definitely been very fun we we first met you um on i guess you you did an article for us uh what was that website we you worked on it was uh Nikon's image chaser blog um, mm -hmm. I think it's now the Nikon Learn and Create, the kind of transition into that. Um, but yeah, you guys reached out and talked about also some of my, a couple of my favorite images and, and how I, um, you know, was first dove into my photography career. I think I was, I was a junior in high school, so I was about 16, 17 years old around that mm -hmm. time and, and still pretty, pretty early on. But uh, uh, 21 now and, and just graduated college and uh, definitely. Definitely a lot has happened photographically since then. So a lot, to, a lot of fun stuff to talk about today. How do you, I mean, everybody has a bit of a different story. How did you get into photography and then eventually move into filmmaking? What was that thing that launched you into picking up a camera the very first time? Yeah, so I went to uh, Colorado for uh, a few summers in a row. Um, there was an outdoor-based summer camp at the time, and I was... Uh, first a camper and then eventually I actually worked as a counselor um, at the summer camp and we did a lot of backpacking, a lot of outdoor um, hiking and a lot of stuff out in the nature right in the foot of the Colorado Rockies. It was a beautiful location. And my dad came to visit and he gave me his Nikon D5100 and I had no idea like anything about photography at all, but he gave it to me to play around with um, and take it on some of my backpacking trips. And I had no idea again what I was doing. I was just a kid fooling around with this piece of equipment. So many confusing buttons, but I managed to make it work and I had an absolute blast with it. I mean, there is just this feeling of indescribable joy that photography gave me, even at the time, even if I had no idea what I was doing. Um, at the end of this trip, I got back home. I had over 2,000 images. And for me, that was quite a lot at the time. But, you know, most of them were just simple snapshots. But again, it was just this feeling of joy that, that um, being able to capture my surroundings, anything from wide landscapes to close, intimate perspectives of the flowers and uh, the wildlife in the area, it was just, it was just so much fun. 
That's so interesting you say that because it makes me think of the title of one of my favorite books, The Moment It Clicks, um, from Joe McNally. And we've talked about that. And exactly that's exactly what you're describing right now, that feeling inside of being satisfied as an artist. And when you click the shutter, that thing that you feel overall, you know, that you know, like you've just created something special. And you say they were snapshots back then, but they were probably very important to you. You know, and I, I, I turn to uh, Ron McGill, one of our other ambassadors, always says, if a picture makes you smile or brings a feeling from you, then it's a great photo. It doesn't matter what level you're at. So, I mean, that's a great entree into the career. At what point do you then start to progress and say, this excitement that I feel for the art, obviously you got the bug, uh, and, um, and you start to move on where from here? Right. So I was living um, in the Bay Area at the time down in California. Um, and after that summer in Colorado, I got back, um, I actually put down the camera for a few months and it wasn't until my mom, she got a Nikon D7000 and she started playing around with it herself. Mm -hmm. Um, and after that I got curious again and I started picking up her camera and photographing, you know, flowers and bees and insects and everything in the backyard, anything I could think of. And there it was again, that feeling of, of joy. And it was just a really great creative outlet that clicked with me. Mm -hmm. And so I got really interested in this and I would come home every day after high school and just spend hours pouring over countless articles and YouTube tutorials on how to get better at this craft. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it was, it wasn't tedious at all. It was absolutely a blast. And, you know, it, it was that kind of research that just is really, really intriguing to me. Um, and I connected on social media and I started posting some of my earliest work on social media and um, Instagram particularly. And, uh, you know, I got feedback and started making connections with other photographers on there. And I would see types of photographs that they were doing and get curious about it and want to learn more and um, come home every day and, and, and try to, to read up more on how to take that type of photograph. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I would, I would take this newfound knowledge and bring it out into the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, I couldn't drive at the time. I was 14, 15 years old. I had no way of getting to any of these places that I wanted to photograph. So I would have to ask one of my parents to kindly drive an hour and or an hour and a half and spend their entire evening with me while I go out mm -hmm. and take photographs at sunset or sometimes even sunrise. Um, but you know, rather than wait in the car, the cool thing about it was they actually began picking up the camera more as well and started shooting alongside me. And so it kind of became a whole family ordeal where we go out and photograph um, together either with my mom or my dad or sometimes both. But That's um, amazing. It, I was going to say that that probably lended to some really great quality time, you know, with your parents individually because back in the day, if you've never processed a print in wet chemistry before, my dad had a dark room in the basement. That's how we connected. You know, he used to play his his country music, uh, Slim Pickens and Wilf Carter, and we'd go into the dark room and I was fascinated by the process. Um, luckily, you've walked into the electronic age here um, where your dark room is electronic, it's on the computer. You don't have to worry about the smell of fixer. Um, hopefully, maybe one day you do play with that process so you can enjoy what we got to enjoy in all the chemicals and smells. But um, but that's a great thing to be able to share that kind of quality time. It, and so landscape is what you loved right out of the gate. I mean, that's more of, I mean, coming up, uh, growing up in Colorado, being that area or being on the West Coast where you are, there's some beautiful landscapes. Definitely. Um, Yes, landscapes, uh, cityscapes at the time, especially in the San Francisco area, um, that was primarily what I focused on. You know, in the beginning, though, there were so many different uh, genres of photography that I dived into. Um, I, would, I would come home and, and just pick up a camera and photograph anything that was interesting. Macro details of, you know, some textures outside, um, a close-up of my, one of my cat's eyes, uh, anything like that. I'd even set up, you know, some creative still life scenes where I have like these rows of these little tiny candles that we had, like a set of candles lying around the house. I put them on my uh, coffee table and lit them and turned the lights out and blew out one of the candles. So it was just like, it was kind of creative still, still life things. But uh, 
you know, it, it really seemed like the possibilities were endless at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And it still feels that way today. But back then it was like, you know, the sky's the limit. And, uh, you know, I can, I can go anywhere with this. And, and now I've kind of honed in towards the nature landscape, um, mm -hmm. a kind of fine art uh, genre. I know we can't delve too deep into it because we're going to focus on your still images, but I do want to tout that you are a filmmaker. You post a lot of great video uh, work uh, on your website and, and your various social pages, and maybe that's a conversation for another time. But uh, definitely, if you have the opportunity, we did an Instagram Live uh, with Taylor, uh, and we talked about how to make a really cool sizzle reel of your videos and your work. So go back to that. You know, Check that out on the NikonUSA.com site, the Creator's Hour, and look for the schedules and things that we posted. Um, so let's let's launch some of these pictures because I really want to hear the backstories. I love the backstories on photos, and we're going to make the pictures fill the frame here. And as as I say to everybody, don't spare any details here. Talk to us about what brings you here. What is this picture about? Who's in the photo? I love the layering of the mountains. I mean, I love the layering and landscape in general. Um, but what is this picture, and what does it mean to you? So this was a picture I took in Colorado. Um, these are, this is an, an elevation at 14,000 feet. So Colorado has over 50 peaks that reach the elevation of 14,000 uh, feet. And, you know, people make it their goal to, to do all 50 um, by the end of their lifetime. I think I've gotten around nine or 10 of them. But this particular peak was La Plata. And this was a very special morning because it was a backpacking trip, about three to four day backpacking trip into the Rockies. And um, this was a sunrise peak. So we wanted to peak the, the mountain by sunrise. It probably took around five to six hours to do um, maybe like a 12 mile round trip um, hike. But to get up here at sunrise, we had to start around midnight. So we were hiking in the dark up the trail. Um, uh, <laughs> guided by our headlamps and our flashlights. And I still vividly remember, as I'm climbing those last couple stretches all the way up to the peak, the crescent moon rises over the horizon and it just illuminates the, the landscape and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and as it gets brighter and brighter and the day starts, um, the sun starts to rise, you can see, you can kind of see on the left hand, the back left hand side of the image, there's these valleys of fog so we were in these peaks, and there's these valleys of fog flowing in and out of the peaks. Um, as the sun that that fog, as the sun rose, the fog started to dissipate a little bit. Um, but I really wanted to capture that human element in this photograph, so I decided to put myself into the frame. I had a tripod with me, and you know, on a backpacking trip, you know, every every little pound counts, every ounce counts. So a tripod is something that's you know, some back, hardcore backpackers might not want to bring with them. But for me, as you know, I have to have that with me. Um, and thankfully, I, I brought it with me for this one because I needed it for this shot. So I set my camera up on a tripod um, and using the camera's interval timer shooting, I just started firing mm -hmm. off images and climbed onto this, uh, this ridge that you see here um, and struck up a pose and, and looked out at the peaks in front of me. And it was just really a fantastic morning overall. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the elevation part because I know that's something that's very critical. I've talked to other photographers and Corey Rich about this a lot. I mean, you just can't step up to 14,000 feet. And someone who's at sea level like myself, you kind of have to gradually over days time uh, elevate yourself. You know, maybe start off going from sea level to 6,000 feet, then to 10,000 feet, 14,000 feet. Talk about your physical being at 14,000 feet. And trekking that, you know, that last bit of climb in the dark, you know, so you could be there, you know, to see this moonrise and sunrise or moonset and sunrise. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So we were based um, around 9,000 feet. So we had a chance to acclimate um, at that level. But even then, you know, the air is much thinner. So, you know, there's less oxygen in your blood. You start to, um, you know, uh, breathe a little heavier. Uh, let more physical activity becomes a little bit more strenuous uh, mm -hmm. until you start building up um, a kind of a tolerance to it and get acclimated mm -hmm. to it. And <laughs> it was definitely some of the harder hiking I've done in my lifetime at that elevation. But 
you know, every time I take a step and you feel that burn in your thigh and you feel that, that kind of, that, that nagging voice that says, Oh, this is really difficult. I mm -hmm. always, the way I work through it is reminded myself, you know, you wanted this, this is what you wanted. You want to be here because mm -hmm. you know, some people might not get the opportunity to see this amazing stuff for themselves. I mean, it's really some of the most beautiful scenery. I love Colorado so much. Um, even when I was choosing a place to go to school is between Oregon and Colorado because I both love those places um, right. so much. But, you know, it, it's definitely more of a, a mental battle as it is a physical. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of it comes, comes from the mind and, and you know, just kind of relishing the fact that you're out there in the elements and surrounded by all this beauty. And that, for me, that's what it's all about. Um, mm -hmm. That's the reason why I love uh, nature photography. This is where it all started for me was was this environment i mean it it's really special still is special to me today and and that whole hanging on to that feeling is, is kind of what propelled me up the up these mountains and and to get these shots here that's awesome we're going to roll on to the second shot you delivered um beautiful landscape beautiful cityscape talk about this picture where are you when did you shoot this and how Yep. So this was, uh, this was a couple this was actually a year after uh, my trip to Colorado. Now I'm back in the Bay area. As I said, this is where I really decided to dive in and, um, and, and try to figure out as much as I could about photography. Um, I, I really had, I really felt like this is my passion. Um, and to, before we start this image, I want to talk about a little bit more how I got into it. Now, <laughs> It was when I was, I was about 13 years old. This is before I got into it. And, you know, I did, I did the kind of normal things that you do at that age. You know, I played on my school soccer team. I was a drummer in my school bands, um, played video games with my friends. But, you know, all of these outlets, all these creative outlets didn't quite click with me. It still felt like there was something missing. And eventually when I discovered photography, both in Colorado and I picked up the camera back in the Bay Area, that's when it really kind of clicked. That's when I was like, okay, this is the thing that I know I want to do. And I'm super fortunate to have discovered kind of like a passion at such an early age and to be able to pursue it um, and, and kind of dive deep into the photography. So this was one of those Bay Area outings. Um, <laughs> I drove with my parents. Uh, I think it was with my mom. And I, I saw the shot on Instagram. I was like, you know, that is such a unique perspective. We're underneath, this is the Bay Bridge, the Western span of the Bay Bridge. We're looking, um, this is taken on Treasure Island. We're looking back at San Francisco. And the unique thing is this is the winter time. So you can see that light on the top of the building, the pyramid buildings, uh, the Transamerica building in San Francisco. And they only light that around the holiday times. Um, around December, January, around the new year. And so that back then that was such a coveted, coveted shot to have in this photography community, um, to have that, uh, Transamerica light beacon just lit. So, um, it was a really special shot for me. This is where I really felt like, you know, things were starting to come together. Um, I had a foreground, I had a mid ground, I had a background and I really dove into night photography. Now, night photography at that time really intrigued me the most. Long exposures, the fact that I could capture, you know, a 30-second exposure and all that movement, all that motion, I could capture that into a single uh, image was just really fascinating to me. I was like, I, I, didn't, I hadn't seen or heard of anything like that before, so I definitely focused more on night photography and night cityscapes. Mm -hmm. it, now, it's extraordinary, for sure. And, and you did this at 13 years old? This was taken at 13? This was, this was probably a few late, uh, years on. This is probably 14 or 15 at this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still a great accomplishment at that age. So the passion continues to grow. You start to feel it. When you set up a shot like this, do you remember the focal length? Um, you know, what lens you chose for something like this? Yeah. Uh, I believe this was, this was with a, the kit lens that comes with the Nikon. This was the Nikon D7000. So I believe it was the 18 to 55 millimeter um, f3.5 to 5.6. Um, so, you know, it's, it kind of also taught me that, you know, you don't, you, when you're starting out, you don't have to have, you know, the top of the line lenses. 
you can you can get away with you know what you have and what you got uh you can still make some really fantastic images with that and you know i always thought you know oh, i don't have you know the best glass yet i don't have you know the best tools and i i, I let that limit me for a little bit and I, I figured you know maybe if i just had this i can i could get a better image and over time i started to realize you know it's it's less about that it's more about your creative drive and your creative process and if you have a shot, if you have a vision that you want to, you want to see come, come to life, just go chase, chase it with whatever you have, whatever um, tools that you have at your disposal, you can come away with something uh, a really, really fantastic. So that was a good, that was a good lesson there. You mentioned before too, that, you know, you went right online to start researching videos and things like that. Were there any photographers or artists uh, that inspired you or what, where's, where's your creative come from? I mean, again, this is early on in your, your early career here, but, but where, where do you find your creativity and, and who do you look to, you know, for, uh, I guess, to be inspired? Yeah, that's great. Um, so the one thing I really miss about um, not living in the Bay area anymore was the community of photographers there. Um, it was such a strong and, and very wide and diverse community of photographers um, in the Bay area. And you know, we would, I would go on shoots with them. It wasn't just me, my, my mom or my dad and I shooting together. We would meet up with other photographers all the time and, and kind of, you know, shoot ideas off of each other and um, kind of help each other out in terms of, you know, hey, do you think my composition looks good? Or, you know, how do you think this exposure is? What would you do differently? And kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and so, you know, these, these guys were, probably twice or three times my age at the time. So I, I was, I, you know, there was a very big age gap, very big age difference at the time. Um, but that didn't really matter because we had a shared passion. Um, we were both really into the whole cityscape, uh, you know, shooting all the different scenes around the Bay area. And, and we were, we, yeah, we had that shared passion that, that really just brought us all together. Um, so in terms of specific photo photographers, um, you know, even people I didn't even get the chance to shoot with as much. Um, there were there were tons of photographers. Michael Shaneblum uh, is definitely one that comes to mind. He's a uh, really great nature photographer, and he's he was based in San Francisco, and um, a bunch of different great photographers in the Bay Area that I really looked up to. I had a chance to reach out to and ask questions and get feedback on my images, and I really think that community really did a number in in developing myself as a photographer and mm -hmm. and learning and really just kind of developing my style and and help me help propel me to where i am today that is awesome there is nothing like a community to inspire each other um big leap i think from the picture of the bridge which is a beautiful picture but this is just outstanding um early morning late in the day where are you where did you hike um what's your vantage point what land tell me everything i want to know about this picture all right i got you yeah so this is yosemite national park um yosemite national park is is somewhere that i can always go back and draw inspiration from i mean i will never get tired of those views um even if it's just visiting the valley um that that place is <laughs> is like a godsend for me because I, I just, I love it so much. It's one of my top 10 places ever. So this was, uh, my dad and I took a trip. It was a weekend trip in the fall. And one of our goals was to capture some low fog during the autumn in Yosemite. And we wanted to get from, to a very high vantage point. So we went, drove up to Glacier Point. It's about a 45 minute to an hour drive from the valley floor. And we drove up there and, you know, you have these nice sweeping views of the valley floor. You have Yosemite or you have um, Half Dome there and, and you can look back at El Capitan and, and see all those views. And there was a, a good amount of fog. And, you know, I, I liked the shots I was getting, but it wasn't something that really just kind of spoke to me. And, and there was no that, that magic that I really felt where like, okay, this image, this is what does it for me. Mm -hmm. So we decided to drive back down um, early morning. We, we got up at sunrise and at this time we shot until probably eight or nine in the morning. So the sun's pretty high in the sky at this point. 
And as we're driving down, I look out across the valley um, to my left and I see this scene right here in front of me. I'm like, whoa, that is cool. This, this fog is drifting in and out of these trees. And you can see in the image, there's a past fire that swept through the area. So um, a lot of the trees were, were burnt and, and dead. And a lot of the trees survived though too. So it was kind of a cool contrast between, between you know, the, the, the death of the forest, but also the recovery that was happening. Right, um, all the vegetation. The life that mm -hmm. persevered through there. And so for, for this image, I, this, was, this was far away. This was pretty far away. So I had a telephoto zoom with me. I believe it was 70 to 300. Um, and I pulled over to the side of the road and uh, got that camera out. And it took me a while to figure out how am I going to frame this to, to where that it kind of just that magic hits. I didn't know exactly how to do that. So I kept zooming in and out, zooming in and out until – you know, zooming in didn't show enough. Zooming out, it was too busy in the photograph until I hit that sweet spot where you can kind of see a couple of leading lines, the fog in and out there, and um, it just all kind of came together. So it, it was a really, really special moment. Yeah, I, I think you bring up that great point about, you know, you have to experiment with lenses that most people would think that you jump right into this with wide angle, which you're certainly going to use most of the time. But compression through a longer telephoto, especially through the mountains when I've been there, always feels like I can isolate something and bring a viewer to, to, to a place that, like you said, it's so wide and confusing sometimes. Isolating those details is, is a pretty great way and technique of, of bringing your viewer into a place, like you said, that you found that sweet spot for yourself. You found that place that you really wanted to be through experimentation. And I think that's, that's a really... Uh, summer after my yeah, freshman year of college, I am on the road, taking a road trip from California all the way up to the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, 3,000 mile journey. And I did it with a buddy of mine. Um, I didn't even know him at the time. And he was a, a friend of the woman who hosted me in Alaska, a friend of, um, uh, of uh, one of, one of her, her, her good friends. And he was the son, or she, yeah, he was the son of one of her good friends. And I decided, you know what? Yeah, let's, let's pick this guy up. He's the same exact same age as me, um, freshman in college. And I picked him up from Sacramento and we drove first time meeting him, drove all the way up to Alaska together. And he was also in the photography as well. So we had that kind of shared passion mm -hmm. and wow, what a, what a drive. Um, it's about, you know, seven, eight or eight to 10 hours of driving every day, uh, for about a week straight. Wow. And you know, as tedious as that sounds, it was an absolute blast. And the reason why is you're not just driving on, you know, of just a, a, an I-5 or a, or a freeway. Um, you're driving in these, these, down these highway roads where it's winding in and out of the scenery and you're passing by all these mountains. And it, it's just one of the most beautiful drives I've ever done. So even though we're spending all that much time in the car, it went by very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we get to, we get to Alaska. Um, and I had a friend there. I met up with a friend in Anchorage and he said, you know, you really haven't seen Alaska until you see it from the air. And I said, okay, well, fair enough. Where can I, where can I go fly? And they recommended, um, Alaska West air. Um, and I took this plane and it was a kind of like a charter service. And I took this plane across the inlet. And this is, this lake is called Crescent Lake. It's in Lake Clark National Park and Preserve. And it was actually, it was a flight scene tour, but it was also a bear viewing trip. So mm -hmm. this particular lake had bears crawling all over the lake. Um, and so they come and they, they, they drop you off and they have a guide. So you don't, you know, they can monitor, you don't, you're not alone with the bears, thankfully. Um, so they, they come and drop you off at this lake and then they go take off again and um, fly away and you get about you know four hours out there most of the day out there and as the uh the plane uh of it landing right as it hit the uh, the, the water there and beautiful reflection and it was kind of raining so you can kind of see um some atmosphere in the image there but uh it was a really fantastic trip got to see lots of bears um and uh actually as soon as i stepped off the plane there was a bear that lumbered right down the beach towards us, a mother bear and a cub in tow. And 
it was definitely one of my favorite experiences ever. And, and Alaska, you know, air travel in Alaska is very important. So it was kind of cool to see, to capture an image that was, you know, kind of that meant so much to that, that Alaskan culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very fun trip. Yeah, I share that passion of Alaska with you. I actually led a photo tour on an Alaskan cruise um, through Glacier Bay and through Victoria, Canada. And, and it's just a spectacular landscape out there. So anybody that is looking for a cool place to go to shoot landscape, um, Alaska absolutely is the place. And thank you for sharing you know, that story. This is just a gorgeous picture. I mean, the color, the tonality, the time of day, the simple subject in a simple place with a beautiful reflection. Um, this is one of those that I could stare at for quite a while. Um, where are you, and what's going on here? Yeah, so this was um, this was on a trip to Chile, and it was very recent. Um, it was actually um, uh, it was with you guys, commission work for you guys on one of your your uh, campaigns. And mm-hmm. um, you know, this is the Atacama Desert in Chile. It's one of the most. It's the driest place in the entire world, um, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I, I had a couple options for places I wanted to travel for this campaign. And, and this was kind of lower end on the, the list, but we ended up deciding to go here. And I'm so glad that we ended up choosing Chile, especially the Atacama Desert. Um, not only was there just amazing scenery there that I wasn't expecting, but it allowed me to, to, to work with this a particular lens that we we're focusing, focusing on as a wide angle lens. And it allowed me to kind of think outside the box and figure out how I'm going to, you know, make some great images in this otherwise very sparse landscape. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I Googled some images about what, what's going to be, what, what can I do? You know, what, what, what photographs can I really capture that's going to be strong in this location? And I didn't really come up with much. So I was a little nervous going on this trip and I wanted to, I wanted to really come back and, and kind of like, wow, you guys, you know, so I, I was a little nervous because I didn't know what was going to be shooting. I mean, it's a desert, right? It's, it's very open. It's very dry. Um, but as I, I started opening Google Earth and, and, and looking around, and I actually ended up coming up with some great scenes. And flamingos, I learned, are actually one of the native birds that come, and it's part of their uh, migratory um, cycles. They come and land, and they, they're feeding on brine shrimp. And it's these little tiny shrimp that live in the salt flats here. And, um, although that probably gets, you know, less than an inch of rain per year, sometimes it takes 10 years to, for you to get, um, rain in some places, there is this water here at this particular lagoon, there's lagoons. And this was at sunset at this particular flamingo reserve. And what was really special was this was my last day in Chile mm. and I hadn't had a chance to really get up close and personal flamingo. So I said, you know what? I leave on a plane tomorrow. I want to capture these flamingos before I go. And this guy, there was other flamingos in the background at the time, but I stayed all the way up until sunset. There, there's guides there as well to make sure you don't get too close to the birds. And this guy was uh, kind enough to let me shoot past the closing hours. So, um, you know, it closes at sunset. This was probably 30 minutes after sunset. And we have this nice gradient across the entire um, the scene here. But this flamingo... He had no fear. This was this shot with he either that or he was oblivious to me. He was happy, you know, chewing on his brine shrimp there. But mm-hmm. all the other flamingos, they were gone. This was the only guy left, and this was the wide angle lens. This is about fourteen or this is a twenty millimeter lens. So mm-hmm. if you can kind of comprehend that, he was really close to me, um, sure. and I kind of saw this as you know a kind of like a, a, a farewell present from Chile. You know, this guy coming up and spending time with me and is some one-on-one time with this, this beautiful flamingo here in the sunset. And um, I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite images from the trip, even though I kind of like the minimalism and the simplicity that it brings. And um, mm-hmm. it, it was kind of like, you know, a, a farewell present, you know, it's like, good, you know, thanks for coming. And, and here's this one last gift. We'll, we'll give you before you head home. So it's it a great, great vibe, such a great way to end a trip. So, you know, um, Chasing Frames to Nikon Learn and Explore. You and I have worked together at trade shows where you've spoken for us. You get a commissioned assignment from Nikon. That's got to excite you, especially if you're trying to become a part of this business. I would think that feeling of being on a commissioned assignment is, is a really cool one. So 
thank you for sharing that. And of course, we're going to grow together as, as we move on. Um, this one, I just, you know, it's funny, before we talk about this image too, it reminded me of something when you said, hey, you went down a Google search to search, you know, where you could shoot or types of images around that area. Back in the day, back in the day, because I'm aging and dating myself, I used to teach Nikon school with my buddy Steve Heiner. And we always used to teach that you go to the postcard rack at the hotel you're staying in. And they would always have the beautiful scenes from around that neighborhood and postcards that you could send home, right? So just a bit difference between the generations and how we used to do things because uh, we didn't have Google back then. But anyway, moving forward, this is eye candy to me. This is just a beautiful picture. You talked about long exposures before. It's Sorry, I lost you there for a second. Yeah, a um, little, little bit of freeze action on the internet. I was basically just asking you to, uh, I was telling, did, did you get the part about the postcard rack? And that's how I we did, used to, yeah. yeah. So I was talking about all the elements here, the stars, the color, the rocks, the trees. Bring it all home for us. Talk about this image. Sure. So this, you can see the moon. I'll talk about the moon first. So that moon there you can see in the photo. That is, you know, they give these crazy names to the, these certain lunar cycles that happen. Like, you know, they have the wolf moon or the super moon. This mm -hmm. particular one is called the super blue blood moon. <laughs> so it was a super moon that, you know, they have like once in a blue moon, right? So I guess this was, you know, the second full moon in a month. It was a super moon and it was a blood moon, which meant that there's a lunar eclipse happening which meant the, you know, the moon was moving right in, or the sun was, the earth's shadow was in between the moon and um, the sun. And so that's what gives it that kind of red tint and color. So this was kind of like a really big event. Um, and it happened in January, I believe, or February, January, February. And in Oregon, if you know, that is our rainy season. So the clouds are prevalent over most of the, most of the state. And, you know, I actually had an upcoming shoot with Columbia Sportswear where I was going to be framing a snowboarder on Mount Hood with the telephoto lens in front of the super blue blood moon. And I was like super stoked on this. You know, I was going to get up in the mountain, get some snowboarding in for that year as well. And it would have been so super fun. But of course, cloud cover. And so what can you do? The shoot got canceled and I had to improvise. Um, so I decided... You know, I can sit at home and just, you know, cut my losses and say, all right, well, maybe, you know, the next one, I'll get the next one. Uh, but I decided, you know, I can either go to the desert, which is a seven hour drive, seven to eight hour drive um, in south, southeastern Oregon, or I can go to maybe the southern coast, which is only a five, five hour drive. And I decided to opt in for the five hour drive. And this was on a school day, school night. <laughs> so I had class the very next day, but I decided, you know what? I can't miss out on this opportunity. So I ended up driving five hours down the coast. Um, uh, I got there early, so I got to shoot sunset that night as well. Um, and it was a whole, made it into a whole photo trip. Um, did it by myself, but I ended up meeting with uh, some photographers that uh, live down in the Southern Oregon coast area. So I got to meet up with them and we decided to settle on this spot. So this particular area is called the Samuel H. Boardman um, State Park. And this, you can see it's called the Arch Rock for obvious reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it was really cloudy, you know, that, that evening. So we were still kind of debating, you know, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? And, and the, uh, the, the blood moon happened around two or three in the morning. So we had a lot of waiting around to do. But um, it, was a, it was actually a fun night. And we just sat here by the ocean waiting, waiting, you know, for the clock to tick down for this to happen, swapping stories with each other. Um, mm -hmm. And it was an absolute blast. But uh, one thing that was really notable about the night is how bright that super moon actually was. I mean, that was the brightest moon I've ever seen. Um, this is probably, you know, this is a decent ways out to sea right here. Um, you know, it's, it's, I still shot this with a, a wide angle lens, but uh, I could see make out with detail just from the moonlight waves crashing over 
uh, individual waves crashing over the rocks here. That's how bright it was. I mean, it was spectacular. Um, so we get to shooting and, you know, I have, I have this huge telephoto. I think it was the two, so older, the older version of the 200 to 500, the 200 to 400, um, F4 for Nikon. And, um, so this particular image is actually composed of three different shots. So I believe we have a two minutes to three minute exposure for that foreground that you see here. So that smoothness you see in the water, that was a two to three minute exposure. Um, right. the, uh, the, there's a separate exposure of faster shutter speed just for the moon there. And then a 30 second exposure for the sky, for the stars. And then, um, I actually blended all those together into this image here to kind of, you know, convey what I was able to see with my naked eye. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of, you know, some, some creative license there, but, uh, um, yeah, this is pretty much as close rendered as close to possible, close as possible to what I could see with my eye. Mm -hmm. so, so go ahead okay um so you know it was a great night ended up getting some killer images and i stayed up all night didn't sleep a wink and of course i have class the next morning that i have to make it back for so i grabbed some coffee and kind of ponied up and decided to drive all the way back to the oregon coast um and unfortunately, I ended up getting, this was my very first ticket, speeding ticket ever, was mm. on this drive back, unfortunately. So word to the wise, if you feel tired, just take a nap. And, you know, it might have been, it must have, it might have been worth it just to skip class. But uh, I'd say this trip overall, it was well worth it, even with the $300 speeding ticket that I got. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a pretty hefty ticket. Um, yeah. I, I love how the elements come together. It's called art. You know, this is subjective art. And to bring everything together in the vision that you saw, I mean, is pretty spectacular. It's not uncommon to layer images and work with multiple images on the same, you know, uh, in the same world. So, you know, that multiple exposures built into cameras, things like that. They're all great, great techniques. I mean, to have to stay up all night is probably the reason why I don't do a lot of night landscape uh, photography, but it is beautiful. you got the stars, you got the moon. I was going to say it was Mars, but, you know, of course it's not Mars. Um, but the color, every once in a while when I look up and I see that red dot. Um, but it's all really, I mean, really nicely put together. And, and thank you for sharing the story on that. Um, you're in a beautiful location here. We've got splashes of color. We've got beautiful big trees, nice, nice greens. Where are you and, and uh, you know, what drove you to this place? Yeah, so this was a very special trip for me. Um, and this is in the Redwood National and State Parks up in Northern California. Um, mm -hmm. these, so we have about four weeks out of the entire year where we have the rhododendron bloom. It's a flower. And you can kind of see it on the right-hand side. It's up in the tree, this bright pink flower. Um, and I decided, you know what, I want to try to catch this bloom while the rhododendron is, is, is blooming. Um, so I, this is early June, probably this is right after I finished finals last year. So I just hopped in, I hopped in my car and drove five, six hours and I made a whole trip, Southern Oregon coast, Northern California redwoods. Um, but the redwood trip was by far my favorite trip. Um, and sometimes you get fog that flows in here. It's right on the coast. These are the Del Norte coast redwoods. Um, and <laughs> This trip was just, it was, you know, you get out in nature and how, you know, it's, it's kind of good for the soul. You kind of feel like take a deep breath of air and, and kind of let it all out. And like, this, this is where I'm supposed to be. This was, this was that trip times 10. I mean, everything was just so perfect on this trip. It was beautiful. The scene it was super peaceful. Um, and, and this, this kind of trip was, I, this was kind of coming out of a creative rut for me. Um, where I was kind of stuck, wasn't finding a bunch of uh, inspiration in my photography and in my work. And I decided to play around with different focal lengths and, you know, trying to stray a little bit away from wide angle shots and, and focusing more on those intimate landscape perspectives like this one you see here. And um, on this particular hike, I spent around six to seven hours on the trail and about half the time, I didn't even pull my camera out. I just wanted to be there to kind of just get a sense of 
you know, what was going on and, and kind of, cause I feel like one of, one of my, one of my things is as a photographer is we're so busy rushing around trying to capture chasing light and trying to capture all these images. And, and sometimes we miss out on enjoying the scenes that we're, that we're in. And so for this trip, I wanted to focus on doing that in addition to trying out and trying to get myself out of that creative rut. So about half the time I was on this trail, I didn't even pull my camera out and I just wanted to enjoy the moment of being there and, mm-hmm. and uh, being in this really just gorgeous place with all these lush green ferns. And it kind of reminded me of Jurassic Park a little bit with like these huge ferns on the side of the trail and, and these, these towering redwood trees. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so for this image here, I, I, I pulled out my telephoto lens and, and uh, really honed in on this, this dirt this dirt road going down here. And, um, I, this is the type of image that kind of just makes me like, this is why this is, again, this is why I do this. This is to capture these, these peaceful moments and to be able to share them, share them with others and inspire others to get outside. And, um, this kind of just embodies the whole reason why I love outdoor and, and nature photography. Well, you, you touch on something that is going to happen to you a lot throughout your growing career in many, many years to come. Um, is the creative rut. You, you know, for me, you just work through it. You just keep shooting. You realize you're not shooting your best, but, you know, uh, it, it all of a sudden it starts to come and then the ideas start to flow again. It's a really hard thing to do. I mean, writers have writer's block. You know, artists, visual artists have, you know, creativity lapses. So, you know, it's just something that you have to continue to strive to fight through. And it's nice to end on a picture like this because uh, it means that much to you and can't thank you enough for sharing these stories. Um, we're going to exit out of this. I'm going to bring you back up to full frame here with me. There you are. Um, can't thank you enough, brother, for the time that you've given us, not na- just now, um, but the Instagram live chat as well, sharing your youth and experience and your passion for this. Um, and I can tell you it's only going to grow. Are there any tips that you throw out there to anybody getting started just like you did? I mean, you're still early in the career here. But uh, any tips for, uh, for, for anybody trying to start their, their, their way, their path into the landscape world? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say, you know, focus on, don't focus on what others um, are always posting. Don't be comparing your work to others all the time. If you feel like you, you know, some, some type of photography gives you um, a joy or you feel really happy about certain types of images, just go for it. Follow that feeling. Follow that, that kind of intuition and, and that, you know, that, that sense that, you know, this is what I like to do. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, I've definitely had times where it's like, oh, well, you know, this person's getting more attention from this type of work. So maybe I should try to focus doing that. You know, I, and I'd say, you know, just stay away from that and, and just focus on, on your unique creative vision. We all have our own vision and our own style and, and just follow that and, and do, do you. Cool. Um, I want to congratulate you again for graduating college. Um, I guess I would throw this out there as a really important thing that uh, you graduated with a marketing degree. So congratulations on getting some business sense uh, into your world, because I think to be successful as a photographer in business, you certainly need to understand marketing and marketing yourself and doing that. People can see your work, uh, just Google Taylor Gray Visuals, correct? Uh, and they'll find your webpage and your Instagram page and all your social platforms. Um, can't thank you enough for the time you've given us. And, uh, you know, good luck. It's a pleasure. Working, working through this with us. And thank you for sharing, you know, your tips of what you're doing uh, in landscape. Check out his filmmaking work, how to do reels. I mean, it's just amazing work and it's amazing body of work that's growing. So thank you, Taylor Gray. And those of you that are tuning in, uh, another really cool hour um, with a really nice uh, young up-and-coming artist in Taylor, um, check out NikonUSA.com backslash Creators Hour uh, for all of the content we've created over the last several months. We will carry this through the end of June. Uh, and uh, thank you guys for tuning in. We want to educate. We want to inspire you. So please, during these times as we emerge out into the real world again in a bit different way, Take that creativity and everything you learned and apply it, and we'd love to see your pictures. So for Nikon, I'm Mike Corrado. Everybody, please be safe. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.